Welcome into the Autzen Audibles podcast. I'm Matt Prem, Eric Scopel on the show as always. And today on this Wednesday, we're bringing in national recruiting editor for 24-7 Sports, Brandon Huffman, to talk a little bit about college football recruiting for the 2024 recruiting class, the Pac-12, and of course, the Oregon Ducks. Huff, thanks for coming on the show, man. How you doing? Doing well. How about you guys? We're hanging in. We're hanging in. We were just trying to figure out, uh, we were talking about this before the show. It's like a weird period of time from a content perspective because football is not in full swing yet for spring football. Recruiting is kind of just starting back up again. It's basketball season, but for us, like neither team is really that special. It's it's a weird time right now for content. So we felt like, hey, you're perfect. You'll, you'll bring the news. It's, it's one of those weird times of year just across the board because you're coming off of February where there was nothing going on, really. You've got events, but then there's not a whole lot. Oh, they came in January. I'm going there in March. They came in January. I'm going there in April. So, yeah, March is that weird time, too, where, you know, coaches are trying to get involved in spring football themselves. They're trying to do as much as they can before they hit the road. So, yeah, but – I think in a month from now, six weeks from now, when spring football is going on, when the evaluation period starts, we're all going to be going, man, how long until July gets here and the dead period comes back? <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, that's very true. Let's let's talk about this 24, 2024 class um, just as a whole. Um, how would you describe the overall depth? Is this like a deep class or do you feel like there's going to be definitely some voids where, hey, it's going to be really hard if – you're looking for offensive linemen this season, uh, or if, if you need a quarterback, there's a bunch. Like, how how would you just describe this recruiting class so far? Yeah, I mean, to that point, I'd almost flip it. It's a pretty good offensive line class. It's a pretty weak quarterback class, whether it's, you know, across the board nationally. I mean, yeah, you got a couple of big dogs like a Dylan Raiola um, and Aaron Nolan who's on the rise, but last year it was such a deep year for quarterbacks i mean look what oregon went through they lose a dante moore and they're able to get an austin of sad late there's not elite elite guys kind of like that dante moore nico yamaliava malachi nelson arch manning um cluster jackson arnold that there's not that elite top end group that's deep it's one or two guys then there's, you know, some good second tier guys. And then there's a big drop, I feel, this year in quarterbacks from the second tier to the third tier. And a lot of those third tier guys are going to end up in power five schools just because of the lack of arms. And you're also seeing more of an increase in guys that are either reclassifying up, reclassifying down. And I think the 24 quarterback class is kind of getting hit by that. On the flip side, the offensive line class out west, especially and even nationally, is really strong. You got, you know, look at the state of Oregon. You've got. Uh, two or three power five offensive linemen in the state, in the state of Washington. You got a number of power five offensive linemen in California. There's a number of them. So I actually think, you know, this is one of those years. And if you're an Oregon fan, you're kind of bemoaning the loss of Adrian Clem and his ability to recruit because of how many good offensive linemen there are out West. So it, it's kind of an interesting dichotomy this year. I want to ask you, Brandon, I don't think we've had you on since Oregon. Or maybe we've had you. They probably committed, but maybe not to talk about these two. But I would I would basically classify these as two in-state commitments in 2024. I know Fox Crater is technically in Washington, but it's Vancouver, which is, to me, pseudo-Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then A.J. Pugliano, uh, top tied. Well, actually, I think. Who's hiring right now? Is it he or Olsen in the state? On 24 sevens, we've got, uh, we got A.J. rated higher. We have A.J. is the number one player in the state. The composite has a number two. Uh, but I mean, you're, you're picking nits there between him and Joey Olson of who's the higher rated one. I'll go with our rating and our, you know, we've seen him more than any other website out there. And I like where we have that ranking right now. My question is just with those two guys, let, let, let the Oregon fans know what they're getting and, and maybe some kind of background of the recruitments for, for why they ended up with Oregon. Yeah. I mean, with, with AJ Pugliano, this was a kid that, you know, he was offered by, I want to say he was offered by the previous staff. I think that offer came at Saturday Night Live going into his sophomore year when Mario Cristobal was still there. Um, and then when Drew Maringer came in as a tight ends coach, he kind of reaffirmed that offer and ramped up his recruitment of Pugliano. And, you know, he's only, what, two hours south of the campus. He's an in-state kid, but always dreamed of playing at Oregon. His first two offers were Oregon, Oregon State. He had some other Pac-12 offers, but it was always going to be a matter of which in-state school he picked. And it always felt like it was going to be uh, an Oregon, 
Oregon pick for him. Uh, the seven on seven team that he plays for is based out of Eugene too. So he spent a lot of time in the Eugene Springfield area. Um, what I like about him, when you look at Joey Olson, Joey Olson's more of a receiver, more of a flexed out, you know, why he's not going to be a guy that's going to put his hand in the dirt and block any defensive ends. When you look at AJ Pugliano, he's your traditional tight end. He's a guy that can put, he, he's an inline blocker. He's a very good, very physical blocker, but he plays a lot of seven on seven and has shown an innate ability to get open. Uh, he runs pretty well. He catches just about everything. Uh, not the, the tallest guy, you know, Joey's got him on height, but AJ's stronger. AJ's a little bit more physical um, at the point of attack as a blocker when he's trying to shed defenders. Uh, and he's a plus receiver too. So he's more of that traditional all around tight end that I think Oregon wants to get at least one of every year, if not every other year. And I just love the physical nature of his game. And, you know, one of those kids, you know, people say all the time, well, well the kids south of Portland don't get any attention. Well, you know, three of the top five guys in the state right now uh, are south of Portland or, or well south of Portland. And in the case of, uh, you know, AJ Pugliano, he's closer to or California than he is to, to Portland. So, you know, one of the probably the best player to come out of that part of the state since Chase Coda in the 2018 class. And, you know, with, with AJ, I still think his best football is going to be played in college. Speaking of the Portland area prospects, um, Jaden Fortier of, out of Tualatin feels like the early candidate. He's a tight end, three-star prospect, if you're unfamiliar with, with who that is. Um, he feels like the early candidate in the state of Oregon who could maybe see his recruitment just kind of skyrocket here yeah. in the next six months, go from like a couple power five schools to maybe – double digits mm -hmm. um just what's your backstory what's the backstory there and oregon needs tight ends and yeah. I, I think eric and i would would say that it would be totally understandable if they signed two so mm -hmm. it, it's not going to be a surprise to me if they go after you know him with a scholarship offer like just what's what's his his background like yeah, I don't want to hurt my shoulder, pat myself on the back, but I will on this one. <laughs> you know, it, it was actually a year ago this last weekend, first weekend in March, that I saw him down in Los Angeles after a week before I'd seen him at a 7-on-7 seven -seven tournament in Vancouver. And he had two consecutive tournaments where he just looked fantastic. Flex style, he was playing more of a wide receiver, but I looked at him and I saw a tight end body. And I put stars on him really early on, and he hadn't played a snap of varsity football. But you looked at the size, you looked at the frame, you're like, this kid's going to play somewhere. And it was funny because the, the head coach, I, I want to say he is at, oh, he's at a school in Central Oregon now. Uh, Dan Lever used to be the head coach at Tualatin, took him to the state championship game in 2021. He calls me after I had tweeted about Jaden. He said, how's he looked? I'm like, dude, he's looked awesome. He's like, great, because you've seen him play more than I had. He was one of those kids that when the season, the COVID season got pushed back to the spring, he got injured. He broke his leg in that spring season. So not only did he lose his freshman year in that spring, he lost his sophomore year that fall. So oh he hadn't played a game for Tualatin at that point, but I saw something there that you can't teach that size. You, you know, he was a, he ran pretty well for a guy who was coming back from a leg injury and probably was still trying to get that confidence back. And over the course of the season, you know, he ended up with offers from Nevada, um, with Colorado state and with Arizona state, but you know, touching on that Colorado state offer, Cole Turner, it, the, the coaches yeah. at Colorado state recruited and coached Cole yep. Turner at Nevada. And there's a lot of comparisons there where Cole was that long receiver that when he was at Plaquemis ultimately ended up being a tight end. And with Jaden, you saw a lot of those similarities there. Um, we've got him as the number four player in the state right now. I mean, it tells you what a great year. And as a former tight end myself, how much the tight end position is blossoming yeah. through the top four players in the state are tight ends and two are Pac-12 commits. And the third is going to end up in the Pac-12. Um, Jaden's a kid that I would not be shocked in the least if this spring sees his recruitment, like you mentioned. I mean, I think he'll be a double-digit offer guy by the time his senior year comes around. And he's a great candidate to be that second tight end at Oregon. He's a little different. He, he's closer to Joey Olsen in terms of the style of tight end he is. And if you can get, you know, we talk about thunder and lightning backfields all the time. It's almost like a thunder and lightning type of tight end duo with him and AJ Pugliano. So he's definitely one to keep an eye on. A little Darnell Washington, Brock Bowers, maybe? <laughs> that's actually not a, that's not a bad comp at all. The, the huh? difference is Darnell Washington is as tall as the state of Washington. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> you know, Brock's not quite as tall, but you know, you're seeing more and more offenses include yeah. the tight end. So I remember the old days of covering recruiting 20 years ago. If you brought one tight end in, that might have been almost too many. You didn't need to have more than two on your off on your roster, maybe three in your roster. Now you got six, seven tight ends that you're using in a myriad of way. And you know, you, you, I remember going back into the the early Stanford days with under Jim Harbaugh. There was yeah. one year he brought in Zach Ertz, Levine Toilolo, and Ryan Hewitt. Ended up making Ryan Hewitt kind of an H back, and all three ended up drafted in the NFL. And here we are in 2023, and you look at the most impactful players in the NFL. Many of them are tight ends. So. Tight ends, the new wave of the future. What 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 is it with the state of Oregon? Because there's Cole Turner, like you mentioned. There's Herbert. Mm-hmm. There's Musgrave. Uh, Malachi Williams, uh, not Malachi Williams, Riley Williams. Riley Williams. Yeah. Um, and then there's Joey Olson, Pugliano, and and now um, Jaden. Like, what's been with this run? Like, that's pretty unprecedented for the state of Oregon. Yeah, you know, it's weird. It's, it's almost like Oregon's got a bunch of tweeners, guys that are, you know, too big to be receiver, but not big enough to be offensive linemen in, in some cases. And they're real athletic. These are guys that, I mean, think about it too, with basketball being such a big sport in the state of Oregon, a lot of these guys were hoopers. In fact, yeah. this past weekend, Jaden Fortier missed the uh, the Battle at the Beach 7-on-7 seven seven tournament because 12 was in the state basketball tournament. Uh, Charlie yeah. Curl, who's another in-state three-star tight end out of Bend, got a couple of offers himself. Uh, he missed the football this weekend because of basketball. So a lot of these guys are super athletic big men, and they're too big to be receivers, but they don't have enough weight to be left tackles or, or whatnot. And so you end up with a lot of guys that are that big, athletic, pass-catching tight end. And, you know, it, I wouldn't even say they're off of the tackles. They're, they're not big enough – to be maybe the traditional inline tight ends. They've got some athleticism. They've got some juice. So you flex them out, and now you can use them as pass catchers. So, yeah, it's been kind of a, a nice little run at tight end for the state of Oregon the last few years. And, you know, the 2024 class is kind of accentuating that. When a guy like Charlie Crow, who probably ends up at minimum at a Mountain West school, is the fourth best tight end in the state, that, that gives you an idea. And, you know, two other guys that I love, they're both being recruited as athletes, but both out of Westland High School, Gus and Wiley Donnerberg, they're both oh, kind yeah. of that flexed out receiver, not true receivers, but maybe more that wide flexed out tight end. So it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, five or six guys that kind of played that role from the state of Oregon signing in 2024. Yeah, Westland's got some dudes, whether they're 2024s or 2025s. Like Yes. I, I was pretty surpri- pretty impressed by their underclassmen at the state championship game. And you know what? The just to, to whet the appetite of Oregon fans because they may still be salty about the departure of Elijah Molden a few years ago. But remember, Alex Molden was a duck, and yeah. Josiah Molden is going to be a freshman at Westland High School. And this is a kid that I refuse to watch youth football. I, I just won't do it. But when an eighth grader is playing with the eleventh graders in the seven on seven circuit. And he's holding his own and looks like a dude. This is a guy you got to get excited about. So Oregon fans, your your first target in 2027 might be Josiah Molden, speaking of Western High School. I'm not ready for that conversation. 2027, that's like two years older than my oldest son. I'm not ready for that. Three years older than my my youngest. So that means that I'm getting old at that point. I was just going to say, Matt, you realize that I guess for you too, Huff, you're going to start recovering recruiting. And it's going to be kids that are, are 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 older than or younger than your kids at a certain point here, which is which is going to be bizarre for both of you, I'm sure. I started doing this job before my oldest was born. She's now a freshman in college. And, <laughs> you know, covering the 2022 class was covering her class. And now my son's in the 2024 class. A lot of these guys he's played with, played against. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you, you start to realize I'm not as old as Greg Biggins, though. Greg is well into covering second generation guys now. I haven't gotten to that point yet. Once I get to the second generation of guys I covered, that might be time to get my AARP card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Huff, I wanted to ask you more about the Pacific Northwest. I know that's where you're most familiar. Um, you know, we haven't talked about there's a couple offensive linemen in the state of Oregon. Um, Devin Brooks, uh, Trent Ferguson. I think Ferguson has an Oregon off. We've mentioned Crater, offensive lineman up in up in Washington. But I guess the the big meal ticket probably is Afua, and I'm curious just kind of where you think Oregon stands with him. And I'll just keep it kind of open ended. And in general, the offensive line position and how much you think they'll get done, kind of more regional as opposed to nationally. 
Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to recruit nationally still because they've got the cachet to do that. They've got the the brand. Um, you know, a lot of it's going to be how well Elite Terry slides into that role. Uh, but what's probably a benefit for him is that there is, like you mentioned, Eric, a, a strong regional group of offensive linemen that Oregon's already offered, that Oregon already likes, that they already value, they already have on their board that Dan Lanning has already signed off on. You've got Devin Brooks, you've got Fox Crater, you've got Papa Fua, uh, who's been one of their top guys on their board. Um, you've got Trent Ferguson, who is a very, probably the most intriguing player uh, in the state of Oregon in 2024. Um, Played four games of, of high school football, period. He's a basketball guy and just happened to have one of his better games against Sheldon High School, uh, in which Adrian Clem and Tony Tuoti were both there to watch their sons play, and yeah. Ferguson got an offer. So he's still relatively new to the game of football. Uh, you can't teach a size. I saw him at a five-on-five five about three weeks ago down in Vancouver, and you know he, he might have an inch on Fox Crater, a little bit thicker, not a, as technically sound yet because it's still so raw. Um, and you know that's an intriguing player. That's the kind of guy that – when you look at Adrian Clem's track record at UCLA, he had Colt Miller, a guy who was more of a basketball mm. player, ended up a first round draft pick. And, right. you know, you could take a couple of developmental guys when you're in on a guy like a Fox creator, when you're in on a guy like Papa Fu. So, you know, going to Papa, uh, talk to him at that same event. And he said, yeah, he was shocked that Adrian Clem left, um, but that didn't do anything to hurt his relationship with Oregon. He just wants to get to know Elite Terry. He already knows Lanny. He already knows the other assistant coaches. Um, you know, they've made it a point to be reaching out to him. He's going to be back down there visiting in April. So they're doing a really good job of getting that transition from Clem to Terry and making sure that those guys in the Northwest are priorities. But then you go back into California and you've got like Brandon Baker with his ties to the University of Oregon. They haven't stopped recruiting him either. So, you know, they're going to have a strong regional nucleus that they can recruit from. And maybe they don't bring in all five. Maybe they bring in three. And then they go for three national guys, a California, a Texan, a Florida, or an East Coast guy. But I think that that's kind of a, uh, you know, it's like Drew Merringer having the options at tight end. He's got many to choose from. That's one thing that helps with a, a first-time position coach and, you know, kind of getting to be the primary recruiter. When you have plentiful options locally it makes it easier to get those guys on campus it makes it easier to let those guys know hey this is a you know a school that's relatively close to home you know come be a part of this and it's better than you know taking over to school where there's no recruiting base that you've got any ties to he's going to have some options it doesn't hurt that a guy like fox crater committed before his stock really started to take off so now if you're oregon you have to worry about the Auburn offers, the Georgia offers, the Texas A&M offers, does Texas and Oklahoma get involved? Now you got to play defense, but it's better to be able to play defense than your offense having no shot. Speaking with national recruiting editor Brandon Huffman of 24-7 Sports here on this edition of the Austin Audible's podcast. Um, Huff, quarterback. Mm -hmm. The Ducks need a quarterback in this class. Bo Nix will graduate. Don't really know yet what you have with but with Ty Thompson. Also, Noah Sad was a great late add at the very last minute of the 2023 recruiting class, but I don't I don't know if it's fair to expect him to be ready day one. You know, year maybe year two for Oregon. That's going to take a jump. It feels like hearing your comments about maybe it's a little down at the QB position across the country. It feels like maybe Oregon needs to go portal. I mean, is, is if, if if you were the head coach at Oregon, is that kind of your your feeling, or do you look at this and say, "Hey, we're a big enough brand. There's a couple big enough names out there. We can we can go get one of these high profile QBs that that's in the class." You know, I'm, I'm going to use a coach that's in the Pac-12 right now, but given his track record when he was at a Big 12 school of how quarterback recruiting can be so difficult, and you look back to what Lincoln Riley did when he first got to Oklahoma, at, or when he first took over as a head coach. He inherited Baker Mayfield, won a Heisman. Then, it, you know, they had a guy that was before the portal, but he was a transfer, Kyler Murray. Then he went portal with Jalen Hurts, even though in that same class he was bringing in Spencer Rattler. But right. he wanted Spencer Rattler to have a year kind of learning from Jalen Hurts. So Jalen Hurts was a starter. Then it was Spencer Rattler. Then the next year, I mean, I don't know, I think it was Chandler Morris he brought in, but it was a depth guy. It was more just to put a body in there because nobody's going to beat Spencer Rattler. Then he brings in Caleb Williams. So Caleb Williams comes in. Then I don't even remember who Oklahoma's target was, but Malachi Nelson had committed in the 2023 class. So if you look back at probably the best play calling head coach in college football in Lincoln Riley, 
even he realized it's hard to get good quarterbacks every single year. Yeah, you know, there's been schools that have done it, but in a day and age of the transfer portal, in the day and age of quarterbacks wanting to play right now, yep. it's hard to do that. So you're almost stuck. If you bring in an elite quarterback, you're going to have to bring in a guy that just is happy to be there, that doesn't mind wearing a backwards hat and holding a clipboard for three or four years. Uh, but you're going to have to go portal for that depth. And, you know, a lot of it, too, is who does Willie Stein want as his guy? Right. So he's got an Austin Novosad. But let's say, you know, just for the sake of conversation, that Novosad's not ready to take over in 2024. You can bet that Dan Landing and Stein are going to be going into the portal to find a guy. Maybe he's a one-year stopgap guy, just a guy to give Novosad one more year before they turn the reins over to him. But, you know, without – I mean, if you look at the offers that Oregon has out at quarterback right now, you know, Dylan Riola, they probably are – you know, they're in the mix, but I wouldn't say they're anywhere yeah. near the top. Um, you know, Jaden Davis looks like he's heading to Michigan at this point. Michael Van Buren's a guy I know that they like. Isaac Wilson, um, they've offered Luke Moga. He was kind of a recent offer. But, you know, with the exception of, you know, maybe uh, if they could get a Jaden Davis, you know, Van Buren's probably a couple years away. Wilson's a couple years away. Both those guys kind of lack optimal size, too. Now, as we say that as a quarterback potentially going number one overall, measured <laughs> Small, but neither of those guys are Bryce. I'm just going to say it right, right now. Neither of those guys are Bryce Young. Right. Um, but, you know, a guy like Luke Boga, you know, under 50% at passer last year, you know, a little bit inconsistent in his uh, completion percentage. Um, so there's not a real guy there. So that would make the portal that much more important to get a guy uh, of playable depth. It's, it's not just about getting depth. It's also about getting playable depth because at the quarterback position, with the, the rare exception of – you know, a guy like uh, Gardner Minshew, who almost went to Alabama before he ended up at Washington State. He, he was going to transfer to Alabama knowing he would be the third string quarterback and just wanted to learn behind, you know, Tua uh, and Jalen Hurts. If guys are going to the portal now, it's because they want to play. So you want to go get a quarterback that can play. And clearly, Oregon has now seen the, and Dan Landing especially, has now seen what a impact portal quarterback can do for that offense. And once you start, eating at that buffet table, you're going to keep going back for seconds and thirds. Red and I, I we're going to talk more portal in a moment. I just am curious on how aggressive you think Oregon staff has been on the prep recruiting, because I think we have seen a shift where some schools are almost prioritizing portal over prep, but I think Oregon clearly has not done that. They, they kind of have their, their hands in both right. cookie jars, if you will, added about 10, 11 in the portal each year, add a couple dozen if they can in the preps, like, what do you think about that strategy in terms of a, a lasting model? And I guess just you, 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 you see what schools are doing. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you were a, a coach, kind of what would be maybe your strategy with kind of balancing the portal element with the prep element? How difficult is this to kind of figure out, do you think? Well, you know, it's fascinating because you're, you're seeing the NCAA adjust from a calendar standpoint because they know how much coaches are having to recruit the portal. They also know how much they're having to recruit their own team, their own roster, guys that are starters are leading because they're not happy with their touches or their NIL packages. So, you know, you also have to plan for, it's not just recruiting high schools that you can develop. It's also, if I'm going to lose seven to 10 guys that maybe are sophomore and juniors, I need to get seven or two guys, seven to 10 guys that are sophomores or juniors as well, because I can't turn my entire roster over to true freshmen next fall. So I think that's another reason why you're seeing more portal recruitment is it's offsetting the loss of experience depth that you're now losing. Um, you know, in the old days, if you lost two or three guys in a transfer, it was kind of like, man, something going on with the program. Now, if you, if you only lose two or three guys, like dude, you must have an incredible culture <laughs> because nobody wants to leave. Um, I still think 80% of a class needs to be from the high school ranks. There's still something to be said about development. If you look at Georgia and you look at Alabama, let's be honest, they're the two flagship programs in college football right now. They're still winning the recruiting rankings every year. Ohio State is too. They're being very picky and deliberate in what kind of portal players they're bringing in and how many they're bringing in, but they're still winning at the high school recruiting. And you saw it with Oregon's 2023 class that, yeah, they had some impact portal players that made a huge impression uh, in their first year there out of the portal. But Dan Lanning knows that Oregon's a national brand. He doesn't need to go to the portal. He can be very picky, very deliberate in the portal recruiting but he wants to go have a phenomenal recruiting class of high school players and maybe a couple of Juco guys here too. You know, 
JUCO recruiting is always the one that gets lost in the shuffle in the modern era. But Oregon's really done well in the JUCO ranks, especially in the offensive line of the last few years. I don't see that changing at all. And you're almost better better off, you know, going and grabbing a couple of JUCOs from the offensive line. I think those guys a lot of times are better off than portal ju- or portal linemen. Um, but the lifeblood, the backbone is still going to be high school recruiting. And I still think you need to have, you know, four out of every five players be from the high school ranks. You get those portal players to offset, and especially with the initial counters still being, uh, you know, irrelevant for another year or two. You go balance out what you've lost. You replenish that with portal guys, but you don't want to be like, okay, we got 12 guys. Now we're only going portal for the other 13. That's not a way to consistently win and not win at a high level. What's your, my last question for you here is just, what's kind of your assessment of this staff? Because year one for Dan Lanning, there was a lot of experience um, spread out across a couple guys. There was a bunch of, his assistants had really strong reputations of being recruiters. Um, I, I felt like as a staff, they, they showed that on-field experience. They showed that recruiting experience um, this past year. But then we, we've seen turnover. Dillingham's gone. Uh, we also saw Powledge get the D.C. job. Um, we have saw multiple quality control assistants or, or analysts, most recently Jordan Somerville, who, who – Worked with Dillingham at the quarterback spot, was a QB coach for the Holiday Bowl. He just got a job at the NFL. Um, new names now have, have come in. Chris Hampton, Will Stein. Um, Oregon State's longtime uh, offensive line coach under, you know, Mike Riley's longtime offensive line coach, uh, Cavana. He, he's now at Oregon as an analyst. Just what's been your impression of – Dan Lanning's ability to go out and reload the roster because people freak out like, Hey, coaches are leaving. Well, if people aren't coming for your, your guys. That means you don't have a good staff and yeah. clearly, clearly did Oregon did. And, and what do you make of just the additions that, you know, they've been able to, to, to pull here for, for those replacements? Yeah. I mean, first two points on that one. One is I think, you know, fairly or unfairly, a lot of the assistants that Dan Lanning brought into year one were kind of tagged with their, well, they're only good recruiters. And then Oregon's offensive line was one of the best in the country. And, you know, if you look back at Adrian Clem's track record, he keeps getting this label of all he can do is recruit. The dude had double-digit offensive linemen in the NFL that he coached at SMU or UCLA. So he's clearly doing something right from a development standpoint, taking walk-on two-star basketball players and turning them into starters in the NFC or in the AFC. And I think that he showed this year that he's not just about recruiting. These are all guys that he came in and he developed. Um, you know, you, you look at uh, Demetrius Martin. I mean, Christian Gonzalez was a guy that he coached at Colorado, comes to Oregon, turns him in. He's probably going to be, you know, the, the highest rated defensive player in the Pac-12 drafted this year. Set the combine on fire last weekend. So that's development. That's not just recruiting. That's development. Uh, Junior Adams. I mean, look at how well the receivers played this year under Junior Adams. So a lot of these guys were basically tagged with the recruiter label, but they had coaching chops. And you, you mentioned that the, the turnover with coaches coming in, you know, Kenny Dillingham going from being the OC to the head coach at a power five school, uh, Pallage jumping from a position coach to a DC job um, analyst, you know, another name, Vianney Talamaval. I mean, had Vianney stayed, Vianney might be the offensive line coach at Oregon right now. Instead, he's going to be the offensive line coach. At Stanford, he had a brief little stop in Flagstaff, Arizona, Northern Arizona. Um, but that shows you the, the signs of a good young staff that's got X's and O's acumen. Because if you look at Stanford, I mean, Stanford recruits itself. So when Vian is being brought in, it's from an X's and O's acumen. He's ready. But when, you know, Jordan Somerville goes to the NFL, there's no recruiting in the NFL. It's X's and O's. So when you have those guys as support staff, uh, a league Terry two years ago was a, a QC. And now he's the position coach. So you bring in some guys that you know can coach that have that ability. And after a year or two, they might be attractive to other schools in a more higher profile position, whether it's a coordinator or as a head coach. That speaks to the health of the staff when guys are leading for upward mobility, not taking lateral moves. And, you know, when they take lateral moves, I mean, Adrian Clem interviewed for the offensive coordinator job of 
probably the top franchise in the NFL. They end up hiring a former NFL head coach and a former college head coach to be the OC, and they convince Adrian Clem to go back there. So, you know, wasn't Adrian Clem making a lateral move? He's making a jump and almost was the damn near OC for an NFL team. So, again, all the coaches that they lost were for steps up, and I think that that shows, A, that Dan Landy's got himself a staff that has the X's and O's acumen part of it down, that they're not just recruiters. So if you look at this staff, you know, you have some names that are mentioned more than others, obviously. Uh, Drew Maringer is not going to be mentioned as much because he's only going to recruit a couple of times yeah. a year. Yeah. Um, you know, Carlos Lachlan's name was mentioned a lot this last year, and you're going to hear it a lot in the 2024 class. Some guys have position groups that they're going to recruit a number of across the country. You look at Tony Tuoti, you know, another guy that I think did a phenomenal job recruiting. And I think – any other year, if his son Tatum's last name was Taylor, then people would probably be more excited about Tony Tuoti's ability to land a four-star recruit in state of Tatum's ability. But because it's his son, you know, Demetrius brought the same thing. And Cole Martin's like, well, how good of a job did you do recruiting when you brought your own son? Dude, kids don't want to play for their dad. My kid wants to go hang out with his friends. He doesn't want to spend time uh, with me as much as he used to. And he certainly doesn't want to get yelled at by me in front of all his friends, which is what Tatum and Cole might end up finding themselves in the position. But you look at two of those coaches, Demetrius Martin was the Pac-12 recruiter of the year, and yet he's about to have the highest rated pick from the Pac-12 defensively in the draft. It's not just recruiting. Last one for you, Brandon, and I, I just wanted to get your feeling for – now we're not even talking recruiting as much as we just are on field, but this might be the Pac-12 swan song. In, like, it will be for two schools at least. What are you expecting this year for the conference? And I ask because I think a lot of people – we talked to a couple of people from the national level, Chris Hummer, uh, Brandon Marcello, are, are really excited by the conference and, and what it can be this year. Kind of what, what, what excites you most and, and kind of what's your outlook for it this year? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that excite you. One is – as a Pac-12 traditionalist or a Pac-10 traditionalist, I mean, growing up in Southern California, going to the Rose Bowl on New Year's Day for so many years, um, uh, you, you just love the fact that, hey, in what could be the Pac-12 swan song, there's three or four teams that have a potential to be a playoff team. And with the Rose Bowl back hosting a playoff game this year, I mean, the last time the Rose Bowl hosted a playoff game, it was held in the uh, world-famous Rose Bowl stadium name Jerry's World. So it's great to bring the Pac-12, but – the Pac-12 hasn't played in a playoff game in the Pac-12 stadium or in the Rose Bowl ever during the playoff era. Oh, no. Yeah, sorry. Forgot about that. Oregon did. That was the first playoff year. That's how long ago that was. Um, but the Pac-12 hasn't played in the last three iterations of the Rose Bowl uh, being a playoff, or this will be the third. The Pac-12 hasn't been in it. So it would be kind of, you know, uh, poetic for the last year of the Pac-12 as we've known it to have their champion in that Rose Bowl with a chance at playing for something bigger and better. I mean, you, you look at the quarterbacks. You, you've got a Bo Nix who for nine weeks looked like he was going to be the Pac-12 player of the year. And then Caleb Williams ends up winning it, ends up winning the Heisman, but Michael, here comes Michael Penix. And, yeah. you, you know, you have those three, just those three names alone, that is stronger than any big three in any other conference. But then you got, can the DJ Uyangalele reclamation project uh, is that going to be something worth watching? Is Cam Ward going to make a jump from year one to year two at Washington State? You know, Cam Rising has won the yeah. last Pac-12 titles, and I think the only reason his name's not being mentioned with Knicks and with Penix and with Caleb Williams is because of the injury he suffered in the Rose Bowl. But he's done the one thing that all three of those quarterbacks are aspired to do, and that's go to the Rose Bowl, and he's done it the last two years. Then you've got the true freshman, like a Dante Moore at UCLA. Um, you know, is Jaden Rashada going to be the guy at Arizona State, even with their portal finds? You know, is Jaden Delora in year two ready to make after his transfer? Is he ready to make it? What the hell is going to happen at Cal this year at quarterback? Um, you know, Stanford, speaking of Oregon, Eugene, former the son of a former yeah. Oregon player, Ari Patu. You know, with, with Troy Taylor, the old Folsom head coach now there with a the Folsom quarterback. Are they ready to make a jump? So there's, it's not just the big three or four. There's a lot of interesting potential quarterback situations. And I think that that alone is going to make the Pac-12 talked about, not for what's going to happen in the conference, but the conference of quarterbacks. I mean, you look at the, historically, the greats of the NFL had a lot of those have been Pac-12 guys. And yeah. the conference of quarterbacks might have their best yet ever era of quarterbacks in its final year. It's going to be fascinating, and I just hope that we do see a Pac-12 school in Pasadena on New Year's Day. 
Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a fun season, no doubt about it. It's going to be competitive. Plus, he doesn't want to go to Vegas in July for Pac-12 Media Day. I mean, besides nobody wants to go to Vegas for July in July. It's going to be hot, and it's going to be hot. maybe, maybe, maybe Clive Koff, the the way he gets the media rights deal is uh, he puts all the media in the pool for for media. Speaking of Rose Bowl, do you guys remember the year? I think it was Larry Scott's first year as the commissioner, where Pac-12 Media Day was held inside the Rose Bowl in July. And it was so hot that they found a box of Rose Bowl hats. In fact, I still have the hat somewhere in my house. That Rose Bowl that January was the Alabama Texas National Championship game. And they came out and they were throwing hats that were Rose Bowl hats and uh, National Championship game hats because of how hot and how sunny it was. I mean, if you've been into the Rose Bowl, there's no covering over the Rose Bowl, but great job, Larry. Well, I mean, that just makes me remember when Eric and I went to LA a couple of years ago for Pac-12 Media Day, and they used Tyler Shuck after transferring to <laughs> Texas Tech. They used his name and body all over the graphics, all over Pac-12 Media Day, and it was uh, like that guy's not even here anymore. Like he transferred. Like just the. the the level of detail. Very forward-thinking conferences, we can see. Yes, yes, yes. That, I mean, we have stories that we could spend hours talking about, but we don't have hours. We need to let you go. We need to thank you for your time on this podcast. Thanks a lot, Brandon, for coming on. I uh, really appreciate it. And we'll certainly get you on this show closer to that June 3rd camp that Dan Lanning is going to be at um, to, to t- discuss that uh, and, and more of college football recruiting later on down the year. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Enjoy Vegas, man. Thanks.